Hey, good morning, Chehi family. It is great to be together again on this Tuesday morning. I hope that uh, you are doing well and looking forward to our, our time together, even though it's not together in the way that I would want it to be together, which would be in person. I, I am so missing uh, our time in person together and camp and all the things that we get to experience. And I know I'm sure many of you are as well. Uh, and we just have to to acknowledge that and miss that. But at the same time, I'm grateful that through technology, uh, we can do things like have sing times together. And I've been so grateful uh, for the last two Monday nights and just the time that we had together as a Chehi family, even though we weren't physically together, uh, to be able to know that we were singing hymns of praise to God together at the same time was a blessing and encouragement to me, and I hope it was to you. Well, we are continuing to talk about hope uh, these weeks, and I want to begin with a message uh, or a, a verse from John chapter 16, verse 33, the words of Jesus. And I shared this with you last week. It says, I have told you these things so that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that was a promise that Jesus gave to his disciples the night before he went to the cross. He gave them this incredible promise that, that even though they would face trouble and even though they would face trials and difficulty, he wanted them to be encouraged. He told them to take heart because he had overcome the world. And I, I, I just want to remind you today that God offers you hope. Jesus offers us a living hope. And that is something that we all need. But sometimes experiencing hope is difficult because of our circumstances. And I want us to consider the circumstances of a man whose story how we find in the New Testament in just a few verses. And, and I want us to feel and experience his hopelessness but then see the hope that Jesus brought him and then think about, well, what does that mean for me? What, what do I have to do to experience God's hope? And what hope does God actually offer me when I'm feeling hopeless? So uh, I want us to begin uh, by using our imagination. So I want to invite you to, to journey back with me uh, into the first century AD and pretend that you are a Jewish man. Now, I know that's going to be difficult for, for some of us, but you're a Jewish man, you're married, you probably have kids, and you're at work one day, and you're out working, and, and you notice a little spot on your hand. And you don't think too much of it at first, and you get back to work, and you're distracted with the business of the day, but on your way home, you look down at your hand again, and you see a spot on your hand. And immediately, your mind begins to race. Is it? Could it be? Is it possible? No. No. People like me don't get leprosy. It can't be. And so you shrug it off and you go through the evening routines and at work the next day, you, you notice it again and you can't get that thought out of your mind. Is it possible that I have leprosy? And you show your wife that night and she, she says, oh, it's probably nothing, nothing to worry about. But her eyes, her eyes tell a different story. The fear, the anxiety, the worry that's on her face is so real. And within a few days, a few more spots appear and you both agree uh, you need to go before the priest. The priest recommends two weeks of quarantine. And, and quarantine's a word now that we've gotten familiar with in this these last few months. And uh, we're reminded that uh, the things that we're going through and quarantines, they're not new things. These things have been around for, for a long time. And quarantine's lonely and quarantine's difficult. And so for two weeks, he's quarantined. And during those two weeks, so many thoughts, uh, I'm sure, are racing through his mind, racing through his head, and they were lonely weeks. And he was expecting what was going to happen at the end of these two weeks. Yes, you have leprosy. Yes, you have leprosy, and you are banished from society. You're going to have to go live in a leper colony. Wait, can I go home and hug my wife? Can I, can I see my kids? No. The closest that you'll ever get to them is a few hundred feet. And you'll live the rest of your life in a leper colony. Can you imagine the hopelessness that that would bring? Right? Can you imagine how hopeless it would feel for him? And maybe you can say, you know what? Uh, I, I don't have leprosy. You know, it's not something we, ha we deal with here in our country. It's not a disease we have to worry about. 
Uh, but you can say, you know what, I, I understand how he felt. I, I get it. I understand how this man felt because I get the hopelessness, because I, I get the loneliness. You know, loneliness and being alone and feeling alone can cause us to, to feel so hopeless sometimes. And, and, you know, loneliness can happen sometimes because we're physically alone. And, and, you know, throughout COVID, there's been people that have to quarantine by themselves. And, and that's incredibly lonely. And maybe there's been a time or maybe right now in life where physical aloneness has caused you to feel hopeless because you're just lonely. But sometimes we can be lonely and have lots of people around us. We can be lonely in a crowded room. And, and that's because of maybe what's going on in our life. Our circumstances make us feel like we're alone. Maybe it's it's something you're going through and you're facing, but the circumstances of life have left you feeling alone and hopeless. What do you do? Well, if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 8, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, in chapter 8. And I want us to see what happens in this man's life, this man who has leprosy, who's been separated from his family, who's living in a leper colony. I want us to see what Jesus does for him. And from what Jesus does for him, I want us to think about what Jesus offers us, but also what he requires of us if we're going to experience the hope that he wants you to have. Because in your hopelessness and in your aloneness and in whatever you're facing or whatever you're going through, Jesus wants you to experience his living hope. So Matthew chapter 8, and we're just going to look at the first three verses, but let's begin with verses one and two. Matthew chapter eight, verses one and two. It says, when he, Jesus, came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, this is unprecedented and shocking, right? This man has left the leper colony which is against the law, and he goes to Jesus and approaches him, and he falls down before him, and he bows at his feet, and he expresses incredible hope at Jesus's power to heal him. Notice what he says as he, as he bows before him. He says, Lord, if you're willing, you, you can make me clean. You can change my life. You can heal me. You can take away this disease that keeps me from being with my family, that keeps me from being with my friends, keeps me from living life. He says, you can heal me. You can make me clean. You can let me hug my wife again and scoop up my kids and embrace them. And so the, the leper has taken a huge risk in leaving the leper colony. He's bowed before Jesus And he's made a huge, audacious request. And then he waits. And and I can imagine as he's bowed before Jesus with his head to the ground, and he's waiting, waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. And you know, there's some moments in life where, where time just seems to stop. And I'm sure for this man, this was one of those moments where each second felt like an eternity. And he's waiting, and he's waiting, and waiting to hear what Jesus is going to say. Will he pronounce him healed? Will he say, you are clean, go? Or or what's gonna happen? And as he's waiting and waiting to hear something, he doesn't hear anything at first. But he feels something. He feels something he hasn't felt in a long time. He feels the touch of a human, the hand of Jesus on his body. No one does that. No one touches a leper because lepers were contagious. And that's how you get leprosy by touching somebody, by coming in close physical contact with them. And yet Jesus is willing to touch the leper. And he feels the hand of Jesus touch his life. Now, there's an extraordinary theological point that that we could remind ourselves this morning is that Jesus, he touches the unclean things, and he's going to make them clean, right? Normally, the way things work were if you, and this was even if you go back to the the Old Testament law and the Levitical law is that when you touch something unclean, you became unclean. But when Jesus touches something unclean, it becomes clean. He came to reverse the curse and the consequence of sin and all of its destructive effects. And so he touches the leper and then he speaks. Notice verse three, Matthew chapter eight. Verse three, he says, reaching out his hand, he touched him and said, I am willing, be made clean. 
and immediately his disease was healed. I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately he was healed. And immediately he had his hope back again. Can you imagine how he felt? Can you imagine the joy that surged through his, through his veins as, as he realized he was clean, as he looked at his skin and realized it wasn't leprous anymore, and he realized that, that, that he was now not only healed, but pronounced clean, and that he could go back to his home and go back to society, and hope had been given back to him. And, and again, we can just imagine what it felt like to have hope again just like that. Now, I want us to shift our thinking for a moment to the hopelessness that we experience, the hopelessness that you might be experiencing right now. And it's probably not leprosy that's causing your hopelessness, but maybe it is an ongoing health challenge that you live with and deal with. Maybe it's a way that you've been impacted by COVID, right? There's so many ways that that COVID has impacted our lives. Some of you maybe have experienced uh, being sick from it. Some of you know a family member or have someone close to you that you love. Some of it's just the isolation that you haven't been able to travel or see the people or be around the people that you love. Or a myriad of ways. Maybe it's affected your household's income or there, there's just a thousand ways that it could be affecting your life. Maybe it's a relationship issue that you have, right? That, uh, that you're going through. Maybe it's with your parents. Maybe it's a divorce that your family's gone through. It's a friend issue, a classmate. It, it could be the unknowns about our future. And wow, we all have a lot of unknowns right now. More unknowns than ever, it seems like. And you know, the future is always unknown to us, but it seems like right now, the future is more unknown than ever. Maybe it's a habit you're struggling with. Maybe it's your past. But whatever it is, it is strangling you from experiencing hope. You just feel like there, there's nothing to hope for. I, 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 hope is missing in my life. And, you know, last week we talked about Mephibosheth. We talked about how David, David reached out to this man, this grandson of Saul, the son of his friend Jonathan. And he restored hope to Mephibosheth and he brought him in and let him eat at his table. And Mephibosheth said, I, you know, why would a dead dog like me get this honor? And that whole that whole story really is a picture of our relationship with God, where, where Jesus offers us hope for our hopelessness. And he invites us to his table and he invites us to relationship with himself. And I just want to point you once again to Jesus this morning and the hope that he offers you. Now, in the story that we looked at today, we see Jesus offering hope by miraculously changing someone's circumstances. And so many times we want God to do that for us. And there are times where he does miraculously intervene in our lives. I know I can look back at my own journey uh, with Jesus over these years and see, and there are times where the undeniable hand of God was at work in my life, where I saw him miraculously at work, providing, protecting, leading. And, and I'm so grateful for those moments. And there are times and there are moments where God's miraculous hand will intervene in your life in a way that causes you to have hope, healing, provision, all those different things. But there are other times where we don't see the miracles happen, or at least not right away. We don't see the, the, the thing that we're hoping for. In fact, we just feel like there's silence and, and, and nothing's changing and our circumstances aren't getting better. And we wonder, what, what am I supposed to do? And does God really offer me hope? Does he really see? Does he really know? Does he really care? And what does he offer me? And is there really hope? And, and what does he want me to do? What does he want you to do in those moments? I, I want us to notice two things uh, from the text that we looked at in Matthew chapter eight. Two things that this man who had leprosy did. Because I think they're key for you and I in the hope that we need and the hope that God wants to offer us. But there's two things that he did. First of all, he exercised faith, right? He exercised incredible faith by leaving the leper colony and going to Jesus, right? He takes a proactive step towards Jesus. He's heard about Jesus. He's heard that he heals. He's heard about his teachings and his miracles. And he believes in faith that Jesus can do something for him that can't be done any other way, that he can be healed. And so he takes a huge step of faith and faith is essential for hope. First of all, if we're gonna experience the hope that God wants to give us, we have to have saving faith. We have to have a faith that brings us to a relationship with God where we come to a place where we believe and recognize that 
We are sinful people that are separated from the God who made us and who loves us and longs to give us relationship. And that we realize that the God who loves us and wants to give us relationship has made that relationship possible through his son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world as a human, as a baby, and he lived among us. And and we're going to get to a little bit about why he did that and what that means for our hope. But he not only lived among us, but he also died for us on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead, defeating sin and death and the grave. And he offers to anyone and everyone who would come to him in faith forgiveness of sin, relationship with himself, and eternal life with him in his kingdom forever and ever. And so if we're going to experience hope, it begins with saving faith. It begins with a living hope that only Jesus can give you. But not only do we need saving faith, we need a faith that that trusts God and believes the promises of God. God honors faith. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so if we're going to experience the hope that is available to us in Jesus, it requires faith. It requires us trusting God and saying, God, despite what I see, despite my circumstances, I trust that you are the God who offers and gives hope. And I'm coming to you seeking your hope. I'm coming to you asking you to to fill me with hope because you are the God who promises hope for his people. And listen, God honors faith. And when you come to God in that way, he will honor your faith. The leper came in faith, but not only did he come in faith, he came in humility. Notice that when he came to Jesus, he bowed before him in humility. And if we're going to experience the living hope, that Jesus offers us, it requires humility. It requires us recognizing that hope isn't something that we can manufacture in ourselves. Hope isn't something that we find or, or work up in our life, but hope is a gift that God gives us. And it requires humility to bow our lives, not just once for salvation, but continually in an ongoing way before him, asking him to do what only he can do, seeking his grace to help in our time of need. You need hope today. I need hope today. You know, I, I turn on the news, I scroll through Facebook, and, and, and I read articles, and it's bad news, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and COVID, and this, and government, and, you know, and, then it, and then just the myriad of things that we deal with on a personal level, all of those things can take away our hope. Or like we talked about earlier, maybe it's a health challenge. Maybe it's just loneliness that you're going through in this season. Maybe you're like me, missing missing out on being with your Chehi family and just feeling a little hopeless that we're missing out on all of that. Maybe it's something more difficult. Maybe again, it's your family situation, an income situation, a relationship issue, your past that you're feeling hopeless about and the mistakes you've made and all those things. And I just want you to know today that, that God offers you hope. Now, it's not always going to be fixing your circumstances. In the, in the story that we looked at today, Jesus brought hope by miraculously changing the leper's circumstances. But Jesus offers you something greater and a hope that's greater than even changing your circumstances. He offers you himself. He offers you his life in you, given to you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, check that out. It says, it says God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. He, it's not just for the Jews, it's for everyone. The glorious riches, he says, of, of this mystery, of this previously unknown truth, Christ in you, right? He says there, there's something available now for everyone and anyone who comes to God in faith, which is Christ living in you. And he says the hope of glory. And so God offers you something greater than fixing your circumstances. He offers you himself. And he is able to make hope abound in your life, whether your circumstances change or not. Remember, before Jesus healed the leper, he touched him. And Jesus is willing to touch the hopeless parts of your life. The hopeless parts of your life don't scare him. He's not intimidated by them. He's not put off by them. He's not afraid of them. He doesn't put on gloves before he touches you. He's willing to touch the messy, hopeless parts of our life. And he offers us not just his touch, but his grace. Whether it's sin that needs forgiveness, he offers that willingly and freely and fully. Whether it's strength and sustaining grace for the trial that you're going through, he freely and willingly offers you 
that. And yes, he is able to miraculously intervene and he may do that and you can ask God to do that. But remember, when he doesn't, he reminds you that he still offers you his living presence and his hope. And he wants you to know that, that this moment and this day is not the only day. That the hope that we have is a living hope. And it's a hope that goes beyond this life. Because as the Apostle Paul said, our ultimate hope does not lie in this life. In fact, he said if that was true, we would be the most miserable of all people. But he says our hope is found in the resurrection life of Jesus that we will fully experience one day in his presence. And we will experience that resurrection life forever and ever. Uh, this past Sunday uh, at our church, I, I shared the words of a, an old hymn that's titled Face to Face. And, and it talks about the realities of the moment that will be true for every believer in Jesus, that there's coming a day when we will see him face to face. And ultimately, it will be in that moment that our hope will be fulfilled, finally, fully, and forever. But for now, God calls you to reach out to him in faith and in humility, to trust him and to believe him and to bow before him and to seek his grace to help you and to give you the hope that you need. And so if you're struggling to have hope today, I want to point you to Jesus, who stands ready, willing, and able to fill you with his hope. And listen, he, he you know, we, I, I mentioned earlier that we'd come back to this. Jesus didn't just swoop down from heaven, die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and go back to heaven. He came here and he lived here. He took on flesh and he experienced life as one of us. And he went through pain and suffering, loneliness, rejection, being misunderstood, being mocked, being falsely accused. He, he went through all of these things. And ultimately, he went through the suffering of taking on our sin, both the spiritual suffering and the physical suffering of the cross. And as such, he identifies with your weaknesses. Isn't that amazing that, that not only is Jesus the almighty, all-powerful, infinite creator and sustainer of life, but he's also someone who knows your weakness, your pain, your suffering. And listen to what the author of Hebrews says, and we'll close with these, these verses. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The author of Hebrews implores us, invites us to hold fast to our confession, to hold fast to our hope in Jesus, to hold fast to our faith. And then he reminds us that this Jesus sympathizes, empathizes, understands, knows our weaknesses. He knows what you're struggling with right now and he sees and he cares. And then he says, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. I want to invite you today to draw near to God and allow his living hope to fill you and to sustain you and to strengthen you today. Thank you for uh, taking time to spend part of your day with me. I sure do appreciate it. I'm glad you could come here to my porch in Virginia, although I wish we were together uh, on the Cairn University campus uh, together, but I'm glad that we could have this time. It's my privilege to pray for you. Uh, if there's a way that I could do that, don't hesitate to reach out. Don't hesitate to leave a message uh, here. Don't hesitate to send a message to... Uh, Chehi or me personally, so that we can pray for you and minister to you. But I would like to just pray as we close, if that would be okay. Father, thank you for offering us hope. And Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to us and for us. Father, I thank you that, uh, as we looked at today, that Jesus is able to touch and is willing to touch the messy parts of our lives and to bring hope to our hopelessness. I pray for each person listening right now that whatever hopelessness they are going through or facing, that you would remind them that you're willing to touch that place and that you can bring hope to that situation. And Father, I pray that you would allow your sustaining and strengthening grace to fill them. And I pray that you'd fill them with living hope today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Have a great day.